We are live. Good evening. Hello. <laughs> Hello, I'm Claire Snowden, darling. And Laura Knowles. We just literally say it like that all the time, don't we? I don't know how <laughs> many times we've said that between the podcast and recording all of our videos. A million. I think so. So we're talking about estrogen dominance. I think so. We're talking about estrogen dominance tonight, aren't we? It's one of my favourite subjects. Is it now? I really like it. I really, <laughs> really like it because I think it applies to so many people in this day and age. And it makes, when you look at all the pieces of the puzzle, it makes so much sense. It's, it's one of those topics that I think is quite, oh, so that's I, think. I love it. I think it's quite sexy. Uh, so what we're talking about tonight is... Estrogen is pretty sexy. Estrogen is literally the sexy hormone. So we're going to talk about well. what is it, uh, what causes it, and what can be done about it. And there's a few answers to all of those things, aren't there? Yeah, there is. Uh, and I have literally spent my entire life estrogen dominant. You know what? I reckon I might have done as well. I definitely since my teens. Oh, 100%, yes. And the irony is that I'm now so estrogen deficient that I have to take HRT and spend my life trying not to go into estrogen dominance. Despite <laughs> the well, this is the thing. It's not like we don't need estrogen. Estrogen is glorious. We need it for lots and lots of different things. We need it for our energy, to be able to sleep, for our sex drive, for our fertility. It's what makes women look curvy and sexy, and it's what makes women women. I mean, it's how we ovulate. It's how we have children. It's. I mean, there is just so much that is glorious about estrogen. Yep, and imbalance, weight stabilization, all those things when it's out of balance. Oh my God, it's the end of the world. Now, I, I, I reckon recently, because I think it's a really interesting thing because like there's cl that classic estrogen dominant look, uh, estrogen, um, <laughs> it, sits, it sits in fat cells and it's that big boobs, big bum, feels like <laughs> yeah that's how it feels it feels like it's bef before you're due to bleed isn't it it's that puffy big round <laughs> yeah. really round isn't it estrogen is so round yes yeah, smushy I, th I think I have I, I, I know when I have an estrogen dominance issue going on and I think estrogen dominance can be a bit of a misnomer because it can also be that we need to be looking at progesterone as well, which is our other glorious sex hormone that we need for lots and lots of things that is totally misunderstood. And often we have a progesterone deficiency, which then throws estrogen out of balance. And that's where the estrogen dominance can come from. Well, let's break that down. <clears throat> Stop, bring it down. Really, the only time we are supposed to be estrogen dominant is in perimenopause. That's the only time we are naturally supposed to be estrogen dominant. The rest of the time, absolutely, it becomes, it's a, it's a progesterone deficiency. So let's just, you know, talk about what that normally looks like. So in perimenopause, progesterone drops off and estrogen starts doing this. And all the while that there's more estrogen than progesterone, which is pretty much the whole time of in perimenopause, until you start going through the actual menopause, i.e. you've missed 10 months to be bleeds, 11 months to bleed, 12 months to be bleed, you're now a year in, you're postmenopausal, that's when estrogen drops off and they both kind of flatline. Uh, if you've managed to get that far without HRT or intervention, because you probably wanted to kill yourself on a variety of occasions from all the symptoms, including waking up with your fingernails embedded into your scalp. That was one of my favorites. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Awful. Uh, so, that's, so that is the natural time that we're, we are naturally going to go through estrogen dominance, is in that perimenopause place. And it's freaking awful. 
it's the lack of sleep, it's the weight gain, it's the memory loss, it's the mood all over the place, it's periods all over the place, ma, 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 ma. But you're absolutely right that if it's happening at any other time in our life, it is in fact progesterone deficiency. Yeah. Discuss. Discuss. Well, let's, I was, let's look at estrogen dominant symptoms. So we mentioned a little bit about the weight gain and it's particularly weight gain in the, in the sexy areas and the bum and the hips and the boobs. Oh God. I, I, I know when I'm, all when over. my estrogen is, is, is not, it's um, estrogen dominant because of the allergies, oh. I'm allergic to life. Oh yeah. God, I miss avocados. <laughs> but I, it's the allergic reaction to food, to skincare, to washing powder, to pollen, to everything, everything. When, when, and we, we will explain why allergies is, is an estrogen dominance sign later on. Headaches, that's another one that I, that I clock. I uh, know that I'm estrogen dominant if I'm getting headaches. And they're very specific headaches, aren't they? A lot of people describe them as kind of being over like a side of your face and also it's it's like it's so at the back of your head side of your face it's just the weirdest it's so hormonal yeah it's i, I know it because like i specialize in massage work and you know we do a lot of work with the, the, the jaw the tmj and if it's an estrogen headache nothing helps no massage helps no neck fix helps no head nothing well, going to bed in the dark room doesn't really help um sweating that's a real east and a being a bit great one that's like that that is in great um, one yeah a bit smelly and like when you kind of go how i stink like it is <laughs> yes it's that's absolutely isn't it? Like which when... i mean we're gonna oh god there's so much to talk about because one of the things is that we are surrounded by artificial estrogens okay. and uh, hang on, hang on. but i just wanted to say that a lot of people don't get that smell because they're using deodorants and using antiperspirants so when you give that stuff up and you go wow what is this but yeah, so yeah, I was going to say what causes it, and one of those other, things other is symptoms. I was just going to finish the uh, other symptoms: headaches, bloating, heavy periods, heavy periods, or scanty periods, or any general period issues. Uh, yeah, irritable bowel syndrome is a biggie. Uh, Thyroid issues, skin issues, skin issues. Eastern dominance is fun awful it's absolutely oh, mind you i'm now you know technically estrogen deficient being you know menopausal and that's just just as little fun as <laughs> <laughs> just the journey of being with estrogen there's got to be like this incredible balance where when you're in it when estrogen's in it's perfect it must be amazing women where they could run 10 miles and then do this amazing job and they do all of this and they like really you know find it no effort they can eat cake and i'm like oh god you've got your estrogen's great oh. your relationship with estrogen is great mine's not um, <laughs> yes, mine. yeah big boobs big hips periods all over the place can be really heavy really painful often mm. uh smelly uh, histamine that's what we were talking about because when uh, estrogen can, is high when we're estrogen dominant it, dominant it can stimulate histamine in our gut which means that we become intolerant to everything yes yes, yes. and scratchy oh my god itchy itchy it <laughs> the itchy and scratchy show isn't it uh, yeah. <laughs> burning mouth that's a common one or you used to get the metallic taste yeah, which is also a sign of early pregnancy as your estrogen is starting to go off. So that metallic taste. It's hideous. 
Yes, I understand. So why, why God, why? Why would our estrogen be all over the place? Well, so estrogen is an interesting one. There's a few hormones, well, we have many hormones, but there's some hormones that are so essential for life, we have receptors in every single cell of our body for them. So insulin is one, so blood sugar stabilization, that's one. Another one, is estrogen. It's really essential that we have enough estrogen because otherwise the human race is not going to populate. Now, the problem is that makes the body like a sponge for estrogen. Now that's fine if we are making it in the right amounts, but we have a couple of issues, don't we? We firstly, you know, especially if we're going through perimenopause, which not everyone is, or if we've had some issues at puberty and just something's not quite right, we're gonna have some issues. But there are two other main reasons why we will have excess estrogen, estrogen dominance. The first is we have a lot of chemicals in our environment that mimic estrogen. We call them xenoestrogens. And they're, so they're all outside of us. And so we know this from the plastics. We actually know this from PTFE and Teflon. We know this from cosmetics, endocrine disruptors in toiletries. Talking of which, the only chemical I put anywhere near my body these days is dry shampoo. And like there's, I, I've got, there's so much of it in my hair today. It's ridiculous. Does me make it itchy? Oh my God, the thought, the thought of having it on my head. Um, hairdresser tomorrow, lockdown hairdo tomorrow, exciting. Uh, so anyway, so, uh, so yeah, toxic chemicals, pollution, pesticides, these things all cause uh, uh, xenoestrogens to pile up in our body. And also some foods. So some foods cause xenoestrogens. So things like soy, milk, there are some foods that are very, very estrogen or dairy, very, very estrogenic and can, can really contribute to our estrogen level. Then the second reason that we're going to have too much estrogen is because if we have an imbalanced gut microbiome, so we have something like small intestine bacterial overgrowth or leaky gut, or we're eating a lot of refined carbohydrates, what happens is the bacteria in our gut give off something called endotoxins and endotoxins actually then become xenoestrogens. So the big issue is not only have we got our own estrogen to deal with, we're then bombarded by xenoestrogens externally and internally. And of course, estrogen, then, I know it's awful, isn't it? And then we can't clear it out. And our body stops recognizing the difference between our estrogen and the xenoestrogens. And basically we just end up in this toxic estrogenic stew. And you can see, particularly with the obesity uh, epidemic, you can see this isn't just a feminine issue, a feminist issue. Fat is not a feminist issue. It's everybody has to deal with estrogen dominance. Uh, because you can even see it in men who are dealing with obesity issues because of the moods. You can see it, can't you? Yeah, absolutely. So that is where estrogen dominance comes from. And how else do we have it? So that was chemicals and our gut, but there is a third reason, isn't there, which is a particular bugbear for both of us, but you've got some interesting stats. Are you gonna talk about the pill? You go for that one. Yeah. Oh, agree. So I think one of the difficulties that we see is that women who have these um, high estrogen symptoms, so they're getting the headaches and they're getting the heavy periods, the periods are all over the place, they will go for advice and be recommended to take the pill. And this is another xenoestrogen, this is another artificial estrogen that we are ingesting. Yeah. So not only high dose, high, high dose of estrogen, uh, it, if you've got the combination pill, it's mixed with progestin, which is not progesterone. So then we're, our body's not producing any of the lovely calming progesterone. So we've got progestin, which is also a stimulator, same as estrogen going in. You're also taking orally. So if you've got a compromised gut microbiome 
and you're not detoxing your estrogen effectively, which is why you've got high estrogen symptoms, you're going to be making the gut situation worse because you are affecting the gut microbiome again. So the pill can add to the estrogen dominance issue. And this is something we feel really passionate about raising awareness of because we've seen in our clinics that women come in who have been on the pill for years and years and years, have never been told that there is a potential that they could, that the pill could damage their endocrine system and cause potential infertility. That We never get told this. We never get this discussed with us when we um, are recommended the pill. And this, the other issue that we wanted to raise Today, particularly, we're interested in female health and 10 women in 10,000 will get a blood clot from taking the pill. And there are millions of women on the pill. That's and one in a thousand. That's one in a thousand. We'll get a blood clot. And it's interesting because there's a lot of this in the news at the moment because of the COVID vaccine, the AstraZeneca potential connection with blood clots. And we are interested that that is raising a massive debate and as it should, so it's, it's an issue that needs to be um, discussed. But why is it that it's a, you've got much more chance of getting a blood clot on the pill as a woman? So why isn't this being discussed? I mean, we're not shutting down the economy for that, are we? No. We very rarely shut down the economy for anything to do with women's health, though, do we? <laughs> so I think that women are not informed of the risks wow. with the pill, with the effects that the pill has. Have you ever been on the pill? Oh, yeah. Uh, from 17 to 24. Yeah, about the same time that I did as well. Horrendous. Horrendous. I was so chunky. So chunky. I was so angry. <laughs> so miserable. I was so emotional. And I was so anxious. And we, we don't have... It, it's often that women are fobbed off when they come back with these symptoms of, okay, I feel really anxious on the pill and I feel I'm, I'm piling on weight. But the we're told that the pill is absolutely safe. How can that be? So let's just talk a little bit about that because we've mentioned progesterone, but I mean, all hail the mighty progesterone because progesterone has been very, very overlooked in women's health. You know, it's called progesterone and that means progestation hormone. So medically it was always considered the hormone that thickens your uterus so you can hold a baby. But that is so reductionist because actually it does vast huge quantities of things in fact there's quite a lot of research that now i believe that that, that now shows the progesterone is as if not more important than estrogen in bone density in mental health in so many things uh, sleep all these things are really really essential so let's just talk about it for a little bit so there's two angles i'm gonna have to say out loud what i want to talk about because i've got such bad menopause fog today <laughs> The two angles I want to talk about is the, is, the, is, the, is the synthetic progesterone issue. And then I want to talk about uh, actual progesterone deficiency or the estrogen dominance and what happens. So we have this problem that let's just talk about when we put in something like a synthetic uh, estrogen or, or, or an extra estrogen in the form of the pill. Or I, let's talk about you go through puberty and your estrogen's a bit dominant. So that would be, you know, quite typically heavy periods, sort of at age, age of 15, 16, maybe a little bit of puppy fat. Those are headaches, maybe it's a bit ponky. Those would be the kind of things that are suggesting to me estrogen dominant, right? Now, what that actually means at that age, as we discussed earlier, is progesterone deficiency. So what we need to do is balance up that progesterone, which can be done naturally. You know, we can get estrogen out by cleaning up our diet, getting rid of any of the toxins, uh, doing exercise. We can really get estrogen out, particularly at that age. It's really, we can get that out. 
But most girls, I mean, I know I've had situation with my daughter where she was displaying quite a lot of signs of estrogen dominance, as did I. I mean, my God, I found some photos of myself at 15. And I mean, estrogen dominance. Wah! Um, but she was just, she's displayed some signs of estrogen dominance. And yet when I've had conversations with medical practitioners when she was at school, they said, well, if that's the case, we'll give her, put her on the pill. And I'm sat there going, why would you give a girl who is estrogen dominant the pill? So the amount of girls who go to the doctors because they've got heavy periods, heavy bleeds, and the doctors put them on the pill. Now, mm -hmm. actually what we need then is progesterone, not more estrogen because you're right it can absolutely damage the endocrine system the pituitary gland and actually put us into early menopause I've had um teen clients come and see me who have never been told that this could be an, a case and they've been on the pill for 10 years and then they've never got their bleeds back and it's just put down as pituitary damage oh whoopsie but no one's even said to them it's because of the pill but uh hello you know it's it's not exactly a big leap so there's this huge amount of obfuscation, which makes me really, really cross. So that is the actual issue is this progesterone deficiency. Now, so we need to get progesterone up. We need to get estrogen down. All, like I said, very doable when we start looking at diet, exercise and dealing with stress, because there's a very interesting situation, isn't there, called the pregnenolone steel, which giving you a little bit of background biochemistry in our, our, our ovaries are not the only place we make estrogen and, and progesterone. We also make them in our adrenal glands and our adrenal glands are of course are also responsible for stress hormones. Now, if we are quite stressed, there is a process called the pregnenolone steel. You can Google it whereby the body won't, so the precursor pregnenolone goes on to make progesterone, but if we're under stress, it chooses to make cortisol instead because it is more important for the body to get away from stress than hold a baby. I mean, hello, how much infertility is around and why are we talking about the drugs that we're talking about rather than let's, we need to look at your stress and what is stress and what causes stress. And let's just go back to all of these toxic chemicals actually are a stress in the body. So part of the pregnenolone, the pregnenolone steel is partially the problem. On top of that, diets high in sugar, dairy, refined carbohydrates, and stress. I mean, these teenage girls just don't stand a chance and toxic chemicals. So that's the progesterone issue. Well, like we said, that's dealable with. But then we've got this second issue, which is when we're giving girls the pill or the marina coil or the mini pill or the implant or any of those hormonal things, exactly as you said it's not progesterone we're giving them because that would be an answer right oh yeah let's put you on the marina coil because it's full of progesterone and we go woohoo we've solved it no because it's synthetic that's called progestin trademark rather than progesterone and actually if you look at the chemical composition it's closer in form to testosterone and it has that effect on the body not the same effect as progesterone so that puts us further into progesterone deficiency because guess what that is also a stressor on the body meaning pregnenolone steel happens so we end up in this spiral of more estrogen not enough progesterone not even making our own progesterone because of the overriding factors and yet more and more and more estrogen going in so no wonder women are having blood clots and no wonder it's not fixing their PCOS, their endometriosis, their fertility issues, their headaches. Oh my God, no wonder. Well, looking at PCOS, the way that the medical profession treat it is with metformin, which is an insulin regulator because PCOS isn't hormonal, it's to do with carbohydrates and insulin. So this is where we start to really look at how all of these hormones are working together. This is absolutely at the heart of what we're doing. And when there's an estrogen dominant and when there's a lack of progesterone and we're seeing all of these symptoms, then we need to be looking at this entire picture of what's going on with cortisol, what's going on with insulin, what's going on with our gut hormones as well, what's going on with our immune hormones, looking at the entire picture. So well, I mean, this is an interesting one, isn't it? Because there's actually a couple of different reasons for it. And one of them is insulin, so it's diet. 
Another one is uh, androgens. So our, you know, our uh, testosterone and estrogen issues. Um, and one's inflammatory, which would be cortisol and stress hormones. Yeah, or in eating inflammatory. Triangle of foods again. This is absolutely what we do in the clinic. This is what we um, that we explore in greater detail in our symptom assessor. So if you are thinking, oh, I, I might be estrogen dominant, do I need to focus on that as an area? You can do our symptomassessor.co.uk and get a clear idea if this is the pathway that you need to be working on. Of what, uh, in fact, our symptom assessor will tell you where you need to work first. Yeah. So it might be the diet. It might be the diet is going to be one of the key ways of fixing it. And the symptom assessor will tell you that. And we also teach all of this to our students. This is the basis of all of our work. And we teach that through the College of Functional Wellness. We do. So we have two pathways if you're interested in the kind of kinesiology routes so we're able to do the muscle testing to find out where the imbalances are in the endocrine system and and what the body needs and so that was kind of where i was going with this is if we are estrogen dominant what do we do and absolutely the one of the first places we'd be looking at is diet uh getting rid of the, the food intolerances that are inflammatory, that are affecting the gut, because when the gut is inflamed and when the gut microbiome isn't able to do its job, because there's a process that estrogen gets detoxed by the liver and the liver takes this in and either dumps the estrogen in the kidneys or the bowel. If either of those organs are struggling, then we're not going to be able to process our estrogen effectively. And there is a enzyme in the gut, beta glucuronidase, that reabsorbs estrogen that we're meant to be clearing. And beta glucuronidase is there when we've got an, a, a damaged gut microbiome, if we've got something like small intestinal bacterial overgrowth as well. And so this is where you start to see this picture of how important a healthy gut is with hormones. And so we've got to be treating our gut in a really loving way. So getting rid of the inflammatory foods, getting rid of the foods that we're not able to process, bringing the insulin down, balancing that blood sugar roller coaster, because that knock-on effect is going to have, it's gonna support the estrogen, but it's also gonna support the gut to be able to process it effectively. Happy gut, happy hormones. Ain't it just? Uh, we wanna be looking at toiletries. Oh, don't we just? Cleaning them up, clean, go for clean skincare. I've uh, yeah. absolutely, and, th and this is one of the crazy things. If I look back on my journey with estrogen dominance, so I really started to experience it in my teens, and I had quite a you know hips and bum was totally my my shape, and my skin was bad. So I went to the doctors, and like they put me on. Dinette, I think it is, Celeste Dinette. I can't remember, the what the one for bad skin. But little did I know that that pill was damaging the gut microbiome. Actually, the core of my issues was much more gut microbiome. I needed that support in the gut microbiome rather than trying to override my, my estrogen levels. And so I spot in myself that when my estrogen is too high and I'm getting allergies and I'm getting headaches, it's often because my gut is backing up. So one of the things we gotta be looking at is we gotta be pulling, yep. you know, like constipation, you gotta move that gut, you gotta be processing those estrogens and getting them out because that, if you get that back up, then I, I totally spot it in myself. And so there are some really effective um, nutritional things that we can do. There's some, some quite technical supplements that we work with to help the body either support the liver to do its job more effectively, to metabolize estrogen or to detox it more effectively. Fundamentally, the liver needs protein, fat, green veggies, and water. That's what your liver's needing. It needs protein, <laughs> fat, and veggies, and water. Does it naturally <laughs> dominoes? <laughs> it can be really simple, right? Yeah. Just, be, just be clean and, you know, be low stress. <laughs> Poop daily. You know, it's all we want. Exactly. So there, are, 
Yeah, absolutely. So uh, the way that we would be looking at estrogen dominance is we've got to be looking at that triangle. We've got to be getting our food intolerances down. We've got to be cleaning up our skincare. We've got to be dealing with our stress. We've got to be eating the right foods, like you just said, for the liver and also for our hormone system. Don't go on the pill. Don't go on the pill. And um, alternative contraception. Yes, for sure. And there's there's a lot out there. And it's, you know, I, I, I specialize in the, the peri to post menopause um, sec sector because I'm living it every single bloody day. But uh, <laughs> every day is fun. Um, the interesting thing is, you know, there's so many specialists out there now saying that the best menopause is the one we prepare for in our 20s and 30s. I mean, no 20 year old that I know is wants to think about her menopause, but holy cow, she will when she hits 46. And she starts by going, what is this insomnia? And what the hell are these sweats? And why can't I remember the word for broom? Like just everything that falls apart. And that is now the focus that is particularly on women uh, who are having children in their thirties. I mean, there's a lot of pressure on, yeah, a lot of pressure on your hormone system. Um, I mean, I say that I was 27 and clearly there was quite a lot of pressure on mine, but this is where we have to be cleaning up, taking responsibility because otherwise you are looking at 15 years of hell. That is as simple as that. If you don't deal with it in your tw late 20s, early 30s, mid 30s, late 30s, you are absolutely looking at a menopause from hell and this is something I lecture on all the time because women don't know do you know they only started teaching on menopause in schools this year what they, yeah they well we, we actually, didn't have school they didn't actually teach what menopause was and why it was important and when you think about that actually around the age that kids are doing sex ed is often around the age that mums are going through menopause you think, I mean, I remember my mum being an absolute cow bag. And, you know, she says there was just 10 years of being in this fog and feeling awful and feeling like a middle age, you know, like a 90 year old, but as a middle aged woman. And I mean, if we're educating teenagers about what's actually going on with their mums and how to, mm. how to navigate that a bit better, I think that's amazing. And yet we've only started doing that this year, which I find absolutely bonkers because every single woman provided she gets to live to the ripe old age of middle age, uh, is, is going to be going through it. Mm. Oh, it's such a good motivator to invest in your health. Because you <laughs> I look, I, you know, in your best mate, looking at like menopause, I'm like, <laughs> put the veggies in, I'm going to eat the protein. I'm going to the estrogen. <laughs> it looks really hard. Thanks for taking over the team. Welcome. Mine came from birth trauma. It wasn't just because I was, you know, eating crap. <laughs> I was 10 years too early. So, you know. But if we look at both our health, yeah. like we were walking into because we didn't know what to eat. I mean, we were having a conversation today about the crazy diets that we've done in our time and the, the raw food eating and the like the, the 40 days of eating rice and all the different stuff that we've done. But then you also look back at, like the, I was a child of the 80s. I mean, it was all, you know, mashed potato-y stuff and Angel Delight. Like, oh my God, I used to love My parents it. tried to feed Angel Delight to my son. He's like, oh, what is this? Uh, <laughs> this isn't food. Angel Delight, cream <laughs> topping, which was that fake cream stuff and not even the whipped cream, I mean, fake cream. So like we were walking and then you, you get our teens where we're on the pill. Do you remember eat, microchips? Yeah. Those little yeah. boxes of microchips <laughs> and those individual pizzas that were just awful. Awful, awful. Oh God. So then we were on the pill, high stress, high carbohydrate, you know, it's, uh, lots of meds. We both had, had experience of medications that we should, just too much. It was too much going on. A load of toxic chemicals on our skin in cleaning products. I mean, it was, I think, I think the, the kids of the 70s up to now, we broke it. We've we been in a massive experiment in human health since the 1970s and the result equals a global health crisis. Yeah.
So that is estrogen dominance. Uh, and an awful lot of people experience it. And so if you are someone who is wanting to explore it further, then check out symptomassessor.co.uk. And if you're a practitioner and you want to work deeper with this, there's a few things that you can explore. We have our three hour hormone masterclass, which I think is on our, um, our two websites, the so functionalkinesiology.co.uk and functional-wellness.co.uk. Um, and we also do practitioner training. We do an online functional wellness coaching certificate, which is if you want to just focus on the hormone, the hormone work and the nutrition work. And if you get excited about the, the more physical, emotional side to have the whole kit and caboodle, then go down the functional kinesiology route. Yeah, it's super exciting. And then we've got like some basic courses in nutrition for health, just to start to get an idea of some of this stuff and pesticides and pollution and Oh, yeah. I mean, we have literally been talking about this for 12 years and we will continue to speak about it for the next one. <laughs> <laughs> Marvellous. Right. I don't think we've got any questions this week. So. That's us. Any comments below? Awesome. See you next time. As you're doing business with you, Dodes. Always.